Police and AFP seize 200 million kina worth of cocaine. Watchdog launches plan. And National Soccer League defers resumption. Welcome, this is Saturday's News. I'm Shamin Poreambe. 200 million kina worth of cocaine was seized by police late yesterday. Police Commissioner David Manning said the 750 kilograms of cocaine was confiscated at Papa Lea Lea. The bust is one of the biggest in the past 10 years. The drugs were bound for Australia. 50.8. 50.8, about 50k, and there are 28 of them. Police Commissioner David Manning says the RPNGC and the Australian police are tracking down leads to the possible source of 200 million kina worth of cocaine, the largest amount of drugs confiscated in PNG's history. Um, as a result of that, that uh, failed uh, flight to take off, uh, we have successfully, under the leadership of uh, Acting Deputy Commissioner Yamasombi and his team, have successfully uh, brought into our custody uh, estimated uh, weight of 750 kilos of cocaine. This has a street value in Australia of around 80 million Australian dollars, uh, which equates to around 200 million kina. The seizure of this substantial amount of cocaine brings to conclusion a long-term operation that has been jointly um, undertaken by the RPNGC and the AFP and Australian law enforcement. Let me also warn you out there that you can continue to do what you're doing but we will still catch up with you. Police have established that the cocaine was to be transported to Australia on a Cessna model light aircraft, which due to mechanical fault failed to take off on the 26th of July when it landed at Papa Lea Lea just outside Port Moresby. The aircraft allegedly flew at about 3,000 feet from Mariba in Queensland, Australia to PNG in an effort to avoid radar detection. The pilot of the light aircraft pleaded guilty on Friday before the Waigani Committal Court and was fined 3,000 kina for illegal entry into PNG. More charges are expected to follow. We will further deal with him under other, other relevant uh, legislation, um, customs, uh, uh, under the, pen, the new Pandemic Act. Um, we, what we understand is that the, the, he still is um, once he's, he's, uh, he's been processed here, um, the intention is to have him deported where he, um, he will then be dealt with by Australian authorities. Apart from the cocaine, a substantial amount of cash was also found. I have um, an idea as to how they, they've, they've come into the country. Um, what, what has posed a, a serious concern for us is that the Papua New Guinea now um, from the, the size of this seizure um, is, is now pretty much, uh, it has been, it's now confirmed that we, we are a, a transit point for such, such, such mm. drugs. Um, and therefore, what, again, whilst we, we would like to congratulate all the, the, those involved in this successful operation, um, if we do not take stringent measures and, and as the Chief Commissioner said, uh, introduce new, new legislation that, that uh, not only acts as a deterrent but an appropriate um, penalty for, for this type of activity. Um, unfortunately, we may see this uh, continue in the near future. But again, as I said, the Constabi has been around for its people mm. and will continue to be around along with our partners. According to the Australian Federal Police, five alleged conspirators to this drug syndicate were arrested on the 26th of July in Australia. They are members of a Melbourne-based criminal syndicate with alleged links to Italian organised crime. 
Papua New Guinea's Competition and Consumer Watchdog, the Independent Consumer and Competition Commission, or ICCC, launched its new five-year corporate plan on Friday. A primary objective of the new 2020 to 2025 corporate plan is to enhance the welfare of PNG citizens through the promotion of competition, fair trading, and protection of consumers' interest. The new corporate plan was presented to the Treasury Department during a small ceremony at the ICCC headquarters in Port Moresby. Due to lockdown measures put in place by the government, the corporate plan launch and handover ceremony was done with very limited people around and with social distancing practice. ICCC has been under various leadership over its 17 years of existence so far. As part of plans going forward, the Consumer and Competition Watchdog under the leadership of Commissioner Paulus Ein also wants to increase and expand consumer protection functions to PNG's provinces as well as other stakeholders. We are also looking in the consumer protection area, increasing our presence in the provinces. To date, we only have put mostly a very small team. The business activity has grown, people are growing, so with this sort of number of people, we are unable to deliver. We have our structure before DPM now, it will increase our manpower, we are trying to increase our presence into the provinces and let increase our work. Commissioner Ayn is looking at seriously addressing some urgent and outstanding matters for the benefit of consumers and relevant stakeholders. So we are looking at transforming the framework we have under the uh, current arrangement to have a, 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 an approach that will give results. In the consumer protection area, we are proposing an amendment, and I'm pretty sure, Dr. H, before the minister, it will probably go to cabinet. We are looking at that piece of legislation amended to give the ICCC more teeth, more power, more strong. The corporate plan was handed over to the office of the Treasury Minister, in the absence of Treasury Minister Ian Lingstaki, his first secretary, Dr. Misty Baloiloi, was present to receive the document. It's in, in the interest of the state. Uh, as I said, the steer of the dynamics of growth to be able to strengthen agencies and organizations like you so to assist you are the arms and the legs of the state in, in, in supervising the regulatory framework within which all stakeholders function and have their been. Complementing the launch of the new five-year plan was the launch of ICCC's new set of uniforms for its staff. We've been working for the past most two, three months in trying to get the um, like the best tailor to uh, yeah, like to provide us the uniform, and we've been really happy for the support for um, of our commissioner and plus the management team giving us um, the funds to yeah. Um, uh, uh, to procure this sort of uh, uniform. Well, the uniform, as you can see, is really, it feels really comfortable. It's been a while since we've had something modern that, um, you know, you feel good wearing it and coming to work. And you Dennis Orere, National MTV News. With the number of COVID-19 cases taking its toll in the nation's capital, families must plan to have babies as it is also a risk for babies and pregnant women. A midwife at the Port Moresby General Hospital's labor ward says there are no isolation facilities for persons of interest at the ward and nurses are exhausted. She says there is a need for other labor wards to be established in the nation's capital to assist with the number of deliveries speaking to the media recently midwife Joyceph says there are also persons of interest at the labor ward this has put the lives of pregnant mothers and babies at risk she says there are no isolation facilities for mothers who may be persons of interest and the COVID-19 we have so far we have um, um, POI person of interest we have no place to isolate them. Them, Mothers are there. Normal mothers are there, as well as those POI. 
and we don't have pathways. We don't have isolation rooms for them. The labor ward at the Port Mosby General Hospital has been in operation for many years, and it is the only facility serving the people of NCD and Central Province. According to the midwife, the labor ward delivers over 1,500 babies monthly, and with the COVID-19 pandemic in the country, it is impossible to close the facility. In the clinic, they don't have delivering facilities. They just do antenatal check and then all the mothers are being delivered in labor ward. Both normal deliveries and complications. With the increase in the number of beds, nurses and doctors have been exhausted. The midwife says there is a need for another labor ward to be established in the city to relieve nurses from workload. All the Papua New Guinea mothers are coming there. We need the government to come forward, look into labor ward, create another labor ward for the NCD so that they can relieve us. They can do the normal deliveries there and then we can uh, concentrate on the complications. The midwife further highlighted the importance of reproductive health in all families in this time of health crisis. She says it is better to plan to have a baby. They need to plan to have ba their babies. They can make love, but plan to have babies, not just having babies every now and then. And then we are blaming the health workers. It's your job to just go on and deliver my babies and I'll be just making babies. No, we have to do something. A petition was also delivered to the government by the nurses, asking the government to address some of their issues. Health Minister, when receiving their petition, assured the nurses that the government will address their issues. We know there's a lot of stigma out there. We know that a lot of nurses that are working there are not allowed back at home. We are all trying to mitigate that at this point of time. Just bear with us with that. We still have to take it into NEC to approve some of the, the ideas we have for the nurses. Rayon Lakingu National, MTV News. With the COVID-19 response team pushing for triaging and swabbing at clinic level, there are no standard operating procedures for nurses to follow. A nursing officer from a clinic in the nation's capital says nurses in all clinics are exposed to the virus. The nursing officer adding that as managers at their own level, they must have a say in all decisions concerning COVID-19 in the country. The nurses are calling on the government to have their representative in the COVID-19 management team so that some of their issues are addressed. Issue, major issue is that although we are nurses as managers at our own levels, we are not in the COVID response management team. We are not involved there. No voice of the nurses is in there. So that's one thing that's Mipla of the clinic managers, Mipla no Amamaslo Disla. Suppose all the, all the doctors are in that decision making. And if all at the same level make the decisions, how can they look down to pick what's down there? Okay. Nurses, we do the dirty job so we know what's down there so we can, if they make decisions, we can, you know, fight and critique and all these things to make better decisions for COVID response. So my recommendation is this. All the nurses who are at the management level should be in the decision making of the COVID response it should be all automatically in in with the COVID response team to make decisions there. Team leaders. Team leaders, yes. And uh, to for all the COVID response team to stay, ensure that there's standards in all the facilities so that we can do swabbing or triaging or whatever there. This is MTV National News. We'll be back with more stories after the break. Welcome back to the news. The country's biosecurity watchdog, National Agriculture Quarantine and Inspection Authority, or NAKIA, has dispelled information that the African swine fever, or ASF, a deadly viral disease of pigs, has spread to other parts of Highlands and PNG. This information is not true, and Nakia wished to inform the people of PNG that the ASF virus is contained and present only in Southern Highlands, Enga, and Hela provinces. 
As of today, the Lower Highlands region, including Western Highlands, Jiwaka, Chimbu and Eastern Highlands provinces and the rest of PNG are not affected with ASF virus and therefore remain free of the disease. Movements of pig and pork meat within and from Southern Highlands, Enga and Hela provinces are totally banned with no exception. Nakia is pleading to all Highlands provincial administrations and national leaders to adhere to Nakia's control measures in the provinces. A group of villages in the Kairukuhiri district of Central Province are venturing into the seafood industry by exporting locally farmed mud crabs to international markets. With crab fishery a small but increasingly important business, the Poi villages along the coastal of the Kairuku LLG have set up two farming sites where they breed and grow mud crabs and export to Asian and European markets. For the Poe villages, mud crab farming is now the new normal since it was introduced in October last year. Since then, they have two farming sites in Bioto and Kivori. The site sits along the estuarine mangroves of the Kairuku coastline, an environment conducive to mud crabs. Last weekend, a team from the National Fisheries Authority visited the sites. They were there to see firsthand the methods and technology used to farm these crustaceans. But more importantly, NFA's presence in the project reaffirms its stance in providing effective management and training for small-scale farmers to fully develop their fisheries projects. Bennett Maguru, one of many behind the success of this project, saw the huge potential of the mud crab business in Poe. However, he says that huge potential is under threat as climate change and other factors continue to diminish the natural habitats of these animals. Uh, I knew there was a lot of work and money needed, but it, it, it was best for me to get started than wait. Uh, because uh, when you talk about NFA, it's tuna, it's beach them and crab. I did mention that, you know, if we protect our mangroves and teach the villages properly, yes, we are not going to go wrong. Right now, speaking right now, uh, for mud crab, we are at a critical point and we've got to act quickly, otherwise mud crab will turn out like a beach, beach demo. In 2019, a total of 500 tons of mud crabs from all over the country were exported to Singapore and Hong Kong. This generated revenue of over 120 million kina. For the poor villages, they have secured markets in these countries, with New Zealand coming on board this year. Just recently, we've got New Zealand coming in. and. Uh, they, uh, they, they will be coming up to Papua New Guinea to visit me and uh, check facts finding just like what we are doing now. Because uh, they want uh, to be the sole distributor on mud crab in New Zealand. They want mud crab. And the market is huge there, but it's, it, it's for us to do it properly. Meanwhile, the BO2 mud crab fattening site is now a model farm that will teach local farmers on how to fatten a vegetable-sized mud crabs that is suitable to export to local and international markets. Stanley Over Jr., National MTV News. Moriba Governor Ginson Saunu has called for a greater participation between the National Airport Corporation, the Moriba Provincial Government and the Gabsonkeg landowners in the Nadzap Airport Redevelopment Project. He said landowners should be given priority in this project and all parties must work together to develop this project. Prior to the project launch, Gabsonkeg landowners called for an opportunity to participate in the project, saying they were not being involved. Morbeck Governor Ginsen Saunu said this partnership between the NAC, landowners and the Morbe Provincial Government is important in order for the NADZAP redevelopment project to progress. While speaking at the official project launch on Thursday, Governor Saonu said he would like to see the extension of this airport as well as the participation of landowners in the project. When, we when everybody is participating, there will be no problem. We all will be looking forward. This call was also supported by Hugh and Gulf MP Ross Seymour, who said landowners should not be spectators in the project. Did landowners like stand up? Spectate. Nothing or small something that may go silly, but right. 
In November last year, the NAC awarded the lead contract to Dai Nippon Nippo Joint Venture. While the Gabsa and Keg landowners support this development, they said they are not being given the opportunity to participate in the project as subcontractors and workers. We would like to participate or at least work man or monkey we would like to go and work. We would like to equal opportunity for a community in response to these concerns, NAC Managing Director Ephraim Wassem said landowner concerns are facilitated by the provincial government and while landowner participation is welcomed, there are requirements that have to be met. Um, we do not stop uh, landowner participation, however, there are standards and requirements that need to be met. And as and when these standards and requirements are met, then um, if there are landowner companies that, that, that um, subscribe to the levels of um, expectations that the contractor have, I mean, they're free to you know, also um, submit their tender and become sub in, in, in the entire uh, project itself. Lucy Kopana, National MTV News, Lay. Papua New Guinea's stationary supermarket, Teodist, has experienced some challenges in terms of its sales over the last few months as a result of the lockdown measures put in place by the government. The usual back-to-school promotion and sales period at the beginning of every year has not been the same for this year. The company's technology-related products, however, have experienced increase in sales as workers and school students have mostly been asked to work from home. Theodist is Papua New Guinea's largest retailer and supplier of office products, survey, computers and equipment for business, education and home. A family-owned and operated company, it caters for small to large businesses, schools, government and walk-in customers. The name Theodist stems from the company's original roots as a retailer of survey and drafting equipment. Two of the main survey instruments of the era were theodolites and distance measuring machines. Hence, theo and dist were combined to create theodist. With the government imposing strict lockdown measures and schools have been opening, closing and opening again and businesses closing down their offices because of these lockdown measures have been affected greatly and stationary supermarkets like Theodist have been challenged greatly in their sales. But technology products have been to their advantage because staff of many businesses have been asked to work from home. You know, in March uh, and April, May, where, where there was a, 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 a significant uh, decrease in sales, especially in, um, in March there. But yeah, it's inter it's interesting. We're we're actually uh, doing doing pretty well uh, coming through uh, June and July. But yeah, in, in terms of uh, in schools, uh, you know, it's it's been difficult. We obviously have a big back to school year uh, in January and February, and uh, and that's always big. But yeah, I think what we found is that you know schools. Um, uh, 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 closed down and then they come back and it's almost like uh, the schools and the, the parents and, and teachers um, come back in to, to resupply again so it's, it's almost like there's a few back to schools. Uh. With continued international border restrictions in place, foreign exchange has been a challenge for businesses in the country and Theodist Limited, which imports certain goods from overseas, has been challenged by this. Do import. There's there's not a lot here in terms of stationery that is uh, produced in country. So, yeah, there is, um, and that that has always that has been a, a difficulty um, over the last couple of years, uh, being able to get that foreign exchange. But um, look, we've we've done uh, pretty well in, in that regard. Uh, but there's always that uncertainty. Dennis Orere, National MTV News. Over 200 women in Morabe graduated with certificates on Friday after completing a week training on humanitarian projects aimed at improving the lives of women and their f families. The training was facilitated by the Women's Federation for World Peace. Morabe is the second province to launch the project after Jiwaka province in June this year. W 
Almost 300 women from the nine districts of Morobe registered with the Women's Federation for World Peace International, an organization that aims to improve the lives of women. After undergoing a training on microloan, they graduated yesterday with certificates that would allow them to apply for small loans from WFWP PNG to sustain their family. Women's Federation for World Peace chapter, a PNG chapter, has launched a um, the uh, Jiwaka chapter in um, early uh, January of uh, this year and uh, now Morobe we are here to witness and see the uh, launching of the Morobe chapter. The Women's Federation for World Peace International was established in 1992 that aims to empower women as peace builders to influence the community, nation and the world. It has multiple humanitarian projects aimed at improving the lives of women and their families in more than 60 countries, including PNG. Women's Federation for World Peace International also aims to empower women in improving the financial status of their families. We are doing the training for Pacifica microcredit. Um, it's a credit um, facility that we are putting together with the funding that are coming from the Australian women from Victoria, WF, sorry, Women's Federation for World Peace chapter in Victoria. And um, the training in Jiwaka in, in, in January of this year was um, done by the women from Victoria, President of Victoria, and the President for um, Oceania region, Mrs. Anne Balavance. And um, we are doing this training here now. It's the same thing. It's just, you know, going to be a little loan supported by the women of Australia to help our women to just give them a little bit of, you know, economic empowerment and uh, they can make a change in their communities uh, so, and sustain their daily living. Time is stopping, sir. No, this law. Me can bring him this law. Some go back to the province from the East Peak. So me got big la hamu maslo di slana. Me look him on something me black silo triple days. Me look him all same. I mean pack him all mama in sad long. Seven a ting ting way. All he can make him now. All he can come up him this la something. Morbid Governor Ginson Saunu, who was also present to officiate the ceremony yesterday, said the Women's Federation for World Peace through its micro loan is in line with the provincial government's Morbid Kundu Vision Triple One policy. Host province. We committing one million kina loans. Next year, next year, next year, we will put in our budget and by supporting this program. Julie Badui, Owa, National MTV News, Lay. When we return, we bring you news making headlines overseas. Welcome back. In Australia, Victoria's coronavirus has plunged to a depressing new low. Record daily new infections and deaths has seen the government there impose new restrictions and mandate mask wearing for all. Don Knox also revealed one quarter of people in self-isolation when not at home. Army troops riding in Victorian ambulances, a sign of how serious the state's spiralling COVID crisis has become. You know, this is a very tough, tough day. 14 more Victorians have died, the majority of them from aged care, as new cases surged beyond 700. This silent enemy will win if we let our frustration get the better of us. There are now 255 cases outside Melbourne, 159 in the Geelong region, many linked to an outbreak at a Colac abattoir. From midnight, residents in Geelong, the surf coast and surrounding areas will face new restrictions. They won't be allowed visitors in their homes, but unlike Melbourne, restaurants, pubs and gyms will remain open. The data drives that decision. That's where the transmission is. It's not in cafes and restaurants. Even with low cases, masks will be mandatory for all Victorians from Monday. I'm really concerned about it, to be honest. I've started wearing a mask anyway, just for personal safety. The Mayor of Colac was calling for restrictions on his community a week ago. They seem to be reacting uh, miles too late. Nursing homes remain a major concern. There are now almost 900 active cases and 57 people have died. Angela Cucciarelli's octogenarian mother had a fall earlier this week. 
but she's been unable to contact her. I don't know how she's going. Mentally, my mother needs help. And at this age when they are in their 80s, Someone needs to step in and get them out. We need to be clear, aged care is not a hospital and we can't provide hospital level care. A cluster at Pataki Small Goods in Thomastown in Melbourne's north now has 121 cases and there's dozens more in other meatworks. While well, an outbreak linked to staff at this part of the Royal Melbourne Hospital that specialises in aged care has grown to 30. More than 500 health workers in Victoria are currently infected. Melburnians need to put to bed the idea that the lockdown will be over in three weeks' time. The numbers simply won't allow it. There is immense pressure on the government over the management of this crisis. And there's pressure too on the public, with too many Victorians still flouting the rules. Part of my job is to accept responsibility for those things that are not done well, uh, to fix them, to get on, to get things done. A challenge that has no end in sight. Still in Australia, it was almost impossible to get hold of sanitizers a few months ago. Now that they're flooding the markets, sellers are struggling to get rid of them. Some importers are stuck with container load of sanitizers and alcohol distillers and now faced with storerooms full of unwanted stock. At the start of the pandemic, Earp Distillery couldn't keep up with demand for hand sanitizer, and they made a lot of it. In excess of probably 300,000 litres, so yeah, we're <laughs> very busy. Michael Earp says his shift from gin to sanitizer was a financial decision, but he was also responding to a call to arms. We had contact from the Premier's department uh, requesting that we make as much as we possibly could at the time. After supplying bulk quantities across Australia, demand has now fallen and he's got 100,000 litres that he's struggling to sell. We would have liked to have seen a little bit more support from um, the government and both state and federal. Adam de Gelder's workwear business in Lake Macquarie is overrun by pallets of sanitizer he can't shift. I think we're carrying at the moment about 50,500 ml bottles. He sourced bulk quantities from China to fill customer orders, but the shipment was delayed. Now he's sitting on $700,000 worth of stock and is expecting to take a big loss, having suffered from price gouging from both overseas and local suppliers. At the height of the frenzy to get hold of hand sanitizer, Adam de Gelder paid $17.50 for this Australian product packaged in a drink container. He was told it contains 70% alcohol, but it's only got 63 below the recommended guidelines. And now he's giving it away. From one extreme to the other, ultimately we're losing money. Newcastle hand sanitizer manufacturer Castle Chemicals says it stopped production because so many speculating importers got into the industry. Uh, lots of people with a lot of stock sitting in warehouses, uh, overcommitted financially, uh, can't get it into market because of the fact that there's so much out there. Predicting supply and demand these days is as difficult as predicting the spread of the virus. NASA has joined China and the UAE in an effort to explore one of the greatest mysteries of the universe. Is there life on Mars? All three countries now have spacecraft heading for the Red Planet and onboard US-1 is a vehicle built to find the answers. Lift off. Launching the next generation of robotic explorers to the Red Planet. With the best chance yet of uncovering Mars secrets, today's launch comes after a decade of collaboration between scientists from around the world. One of them, Professor Caroline Smith, should have been at Cape Canaveral, but because of COVID restrictions, watched in London instead. I don't mind admitting um, I got quite choked up actually when, when we saw it launch and everything was working. I, I did have a tear in my eye. Perseverance is appropriately named. It'll take seven months to reach Mars, where the six-wheeled rover will hopefully start to collect rocks that can be brought back to Earth so scientists can examine them for signs of ancient life. It would be very simple life. It would be things like very small microbes or single cellular life. So very, very basic life. Nothing like little green men or aliens or dinosaurs or anything like that. Perseverance will land in Jezero Crater, which scientists believe was once a lake. 
The rover has a tiny helicopter which will help it identify samples and avoid hazards. Among those eagerly waiting to examine what Perseverance collects is Professor Mark Sefton of Imperial College. It's an incredible opportunity. For the first time we're going to get samples from Mars where we know they've been collected from, bring them back to Earth eventually and bring to bear some of the most sophisticated, sensitive and powerful instruments that we have on the planet. It could still take another decade and multiple new missions to bring those bits of Mars back to Earth. The Red Planet's secrets date back billions of years. It won't be giving them up easily. A group of snorkeling tourists on Australia's Sunshine Coast had the experience of a lifetime after a humpback whale came to say hello. But instead of just swimming up to the boat, the whale gave the group an eye-to-eye -eye encounter. The whole thing captured on camera. Five kilometres off the Sunshine Coast, usually this is considered a close call. He's going to come up for a breath. The mature mammal made a beeline for their boat. Is this real life? A moment worth pinching yourself. Oh my God. Cameras out, surely no one would believe them. The 10 metre long humpback breached barely centimetres away. <laughs> Deciding it was safe to swim, they took a peek below the surface as the majestic female danced before feeding her curiosity. Together they drifted for two hours. We call that mugging when the whale is uh, basically mugging us and not letting us leave or, or fire the engines back up. Not that they were rushing to move on. I think that's the most beautiful thing is seeing it want to interact with us. You know, these experiences are completely organic and on the whale's terms. This incredible encounter taking place close to the deep channel dubbed the Whale Highway. So you have that crossover of whales. Humpbacks are spotted on most trips. Say roughly a 70% strike rate. But this tops the list. <laughs> True Guy Sports is next. We have NSL and Rugby League details after the break. True Guy Sports. Good night and welcome to Trukai Sports. The surge in COVID-19 cases in the nation's capital has caused further delay to the resumption of the Kumul Petroleum National Soccer League. Papua New Guinea Football Association made an announcement this week that the competition's restart has been moved forward a week. Of the sideline in the competition since round 10 in March due to the COVID-19 pandemic lockdown, the Kumul Petroleum National Soccer League was rescheduled to start this weekend. But just when things look certain, the recent surge in COVID-19 cases in the city of Port Mosby has forced another rescheduling of the competition with a new date announced. In a statement by the Papua New Guinea Football Association, the competition's resumption has been moved forward a week. The new date, the 8th of August. This is pending, of course, approval by the SOE controller. Matches will resume but behind closed doors without spectators. NSL Acting Managing Director Demerit Milang said the competition will resume under strict guidelines and restrictions. Milang said their staff and match officials, including volunteers and franchise club representatives, attended a COVID-19 awareness workshop to attain the knowledge on precautionary measures in respect to the framework of rebooting sport in a COVID-19 environment. He added that players must follow strict guidelines like no sharing of water bottles, no handshake and no goal celebrations in clusters. Milang said everyone involved in the game will be issued passes for entry into the match venue. The mandatory temperature checks will be done before entry into the grounds, with those passing 37.5 degrees Celsius and above to be denied entry. Milang added that social distancing has to be maintained at the match venue where security officials will be present to enforce the guidelines. And the Rugby League, Port Mosby Rugby Football League has been slowly gaining momentum for a start to their 2020 season. But like all other sporting codes in Port Mosby, for the two weeks they are forced to halt their plans. The competition has now scheduled for their start to the next two weekends. 
After several attempts to start their 2020 season, COVID-19 has halted their efforts. The Port Mosby Rugby Football League was one of the first sporting codes to write up their standard operating procedures for the new normal under COVID-19. Aided by the chairman of the league, Dr. James Naipaul, who is a head, ear, nose, throat and respiratory medical specialist. The recent surge in COVID-19 cases in the nation's capital has forced the competition further delay. In a statement put on the competition's social media page on Facebook, Dr. James Naipaul said that in compliance with what is stipulated in the COVID-19 standard operating procedure of POM RFL and an epidemic of COVID-19 surge in Port Mosby, the announcement by the government of PNG for the enforced two weeks lockdown is considered and will be enforced. Adhering to the government directives now pushes the competition starting date to the weekend of the 14th of this month. This will further push the grand final which is now slotted to be held sometime in November 2020. But he said further evaluation will be dictated by ongoing announcements made by the SOE controller and the national government. In the meantime, he said clubs can go ahead and register their players to Poma RFL. Trukai Sports continues after the break. Stay with us. Trukai Sports. And welcome back to Trukai Sports. Rugby League club Connie Storms have signed a memorandum of agreement with an aviation college for sponsorship. Akatek signed the MOA with officials from Coney Storm's club management recently for the deal. The new sponsor is also looking at improving skills of the players of the field. An exciting time for the Coney Storm's club with the backing of a new aviation college in Port Mosby. Club management players and fans were around to witness the signing of the MOA. To um, sponsor whatever activities uh, the league will be doing, look for other ways and means that we can help the community. Connie Stones is a club not new to the rugby fraternity in Port Mosby and the country. The club president says the club is excited with the new sponsorship and is geared to receive the necessary backing to support its involvement in the code. He says the club will build a lasting relationship with the sponsor. To Akatek. You are now become part of uh, Coniston family. We will support you in whatever ways we can. We will help you in whatever ways we can. And it's a long road and it's just the beginning of it. The Connie Storms Club has been a family thing since its establishment. With the new sponsor on board, the club pledges to embrace the code and build players for big games and national representation. The club has been part of the Port Mosby Rugby Football League since 2010. Rugby is one thing. My challenge to you boys, rugby is one thing, but you need to make meaning to your life and do whatever on you. Take both, uh, like, uh, balance it down. Jack Lapave Jr., Trukai Sports. Attending overseas and the Blues felt they had little choice but to persist with Bowden Barrett at first fly half for the second week in a row when they face Highlanders on Sunday. Barrett started his first match in 10 months in the number 10 jersey last week and was one of the Blues' best. With conditions under the roof in Dunedin favouring running rugby, they felt sticking with Barrett as their playmaker was the right call. You saw the way he played and um, the opportunities that he was creating. You know, it's the opportunity that was given to him and he's taken it with two hands and he's earned the right to do it again. Barrett will be up against Josh Ioane, who gets his first start at first five since Super Rugby Aotearoa began, with Mitchell Hunt dropping back to fullback. The NBA has burst back into life with two thrillers four months after being shut down by COVID-19. A Los Angeles derby and a Pelicans jazz match are both going the distance. Linked arm in arm, taking a knee during the national anthem, this is the new look NBA. 
players' names replaced by messages on the back of their jerseys, demonstrating hope around the Black Lives Matter movement. LeBron James took flight early as his Lakers took on crosstown rivals, the Clippers. Yeah, he can make decisions if he wants. Kawhi Leonard and Paul George hit back as the Battle of LA heated up. Here comes George, uncovered three. Barter was 34 points from Anthony Davis and a last minute shot from James that gave the Lakers the narrow 103 101 win. In the first game of the day, ironically, four months after he became the first player to contract COVID-19, Rudy Gobert scored the first points of the restart. Rudy Gobert gets things started for Utah. Donovan Mitchell led the Jazz to a two-point win over the Pelicans. Mitchell off the stutter. The fade. Book it. Mitchell bringing a bulletproof vest with names of people killed by police brutality with him. We understand what's going on in society right now. And we're using this NBA platform as the players, as the coaches, as organizations to continue to stand strong on that. Regardless of today's results, the NBA is back and stronger than ever. And that story ends through guys. Sports weather forecast for the next 24 hours when we come back. Sports. True Kai Sports. And welcome back to True Kai Sports. Rugby League club Connie Storms have signed a memorandum of agreement with an aviation college for sponsorship. Akatek signed an MOA with officials from Connie Storms club management recently for the deal. The new sponsor is also looking at improving skills of the players of the field. An exciting time for the Connie Storms club with the backing of a new aviation college in Port Mosby. Club management players and fans were around to witness the signing of the MOA. To um, sponsor whatever activities uh, the league will be doing, look for other ways and means that we can help the community. Connie Storms is a club not new to the rugby fraternity in Port Mosby and the country. The club president says the club is excited with the new sponsorship and is geared to receive the necessary backing to support its involvement in the code. He says the club will build a lasting relationship with the sponsor. To Akatek, you are now become part of uh, Connie Storms family. We will support you in whatever ways we can. We will help you in whatever ways we can. And it's a long road and it's just the beginning of it. The Connie Storms Club has been a family thing since its establishment. With the new sponsor on board, the club pledges to embrace the code and build players for big games and national representation. The club has been part of the Port Mosby Rugby Football League since 2010. Rugby is one thing. My challenge to you boys, rugby is one thing, but you need to make meaning to your life and do whatever on you. Take both, uh, like, uh, balance it down. Jack LaPave Jr., Trukai Sports. Attending overseas and the Blues felt they had little choice but to persist with Bowden Barrett at first fly half for the second week in a row when they face Highlanders on Sunday. Barrett started his first match in 10 months in the number 10 jersey last week and was one of the Blues' best. With conditions under the roof in Dunedin favouring running rugby, they felt sticking with Barrett as their playmaker was the right call. You saw the way he played and um, the opportunities that he was creating. You know, it's the opportunity that was given to him and he's taken it with two hands and he's earned the right to do it again. Barrett will be up against Josh Ioane, who gets his first start at first five since Super Rugby Aotearoa began, with Mitchell Hunt dropping back to fullback. The NBA has burst back into life with two thrillers four months after being shut down by COVID-19. A Los Angeles derby and a Pelicans jazz march are both going the distance. Linked arm in arm, taking a knee during the national anthem. This is the new look NBA. 
players' names replaced by messages on the back of their jerseys, demonstrating hope around the Black Lives Matter movement. LeBron James took flight early as his Lakers took on crosstown rivals, the Clippers. Yeah, he can make decisions if he wants. Kawhi Leonard and Paul George hit back as the Battle of LA heated up. Here comes George, uncovered three, bucket. Barter was 34 points from Anthony Davis and a last minute shot from James that gave the Lakers the narrow 103-101 win. In the first game of the day, ironically, four months after he became the first player to contract COVID-19, Rudy Gobert scored the first points of the restart. Rudy Gobert gets things started for Utah. Donovan Mitchell led the Jazz to a two-point win over the Pelicans. Mitchell off the stutter. The fade. Book it. Mitchell bringing a bulletproof vest with names of people killed by police brutality with him. We understand what's going on in society right now. And we're using this NBA platform as the players, as the coaches, as organizations to continue to stand strong on that. Regardless of today's results, the NBA is back and stronger than ever. And that story ends through guys sports weather forecast for the next 24 hours when we come back. True Kai Sports. This weather update is proudly brought to you by Money Plus. With you always. Weather forecast for the next 24 hours in the southern region. Port Moresby, fine and partly sunny. Daru, Kerma and Alotau, mostly fine, partly cloudy. And Popondeta, cloudy with chance of few thundery showers. In Mumase, lay occasional rain showers. Medang, cloudy with some rain showers. Wiwek, partly cloudy with a few showers. Vanimo, mostly fine, partly cloudy with a chance of evening showers. In the New Guinea Islands, in Lorengau, fine, partly cloudy with a shower or two. Kaviang, chance of thundery showers. Kokopo and Rabaul, a few rain showers and cloudy. Kimbe, cloudy with chance of rain showers and thunder. And in Buka, partly cloudy with evening showers. And the Highlands region, Mount Hagen, cloudy with rains, showers, drizzles. Goroka and Kundiawa, a few rain showers. Mendi and Wabe, cloudy with a few rain showers and drizzles. The weather update was proudly brought to you by Money Plus, with you always. And that's been the news, sports and weather for Saturday, 1st of August 2020. From all of us here at MTV Pleasant Viewing, be safe. Bye for now.